This is Jay Krishnamurti's third public talk in Bombay, 1982. We are going to talk over together the question of fear. But before we go into that, I think we should learn the art of hearing, how to listen, not only <coughs> to the speaker, but to listen to those crows, listen to the noise, listen to your favourite music, listen to your wife or husband. Because we don't actually listen to people, we just casually listen and come to some kind of conclusion or seek explanations. But we never, apparently, actually listen to what is what somebody else is saying. We're always translating what others are saying. I'm sure, as we're going to talk over together this evening, a very complex problem of fear, we are not going to go into too many details, but explain the whole movement of fear. And it how you understand it, either verbally or actually. There is a difference between the comprehension of words and the comprehension of the actual state of fear. We are apt to make an abstraction of fear, that is, make an idea of fear, but we never listen, apparently, to the voice of fear that is telling its story. And we are going to, together this evening, talk about all that. And we ought to also consider the necessity of scepticism and doubt. Doubt not what others are saying only, but doubt one's own experiences, one's own thoughts, one's own attitudes and values, why we do certain things in life, why we believe, we should have a rational doubt, scepticism, because doubt cleanses the mind, it freshens the mind, it breaks down the old habits, the old conclusions, the arcane concepts. So doubt Scepticism are necessary. Not only what the speaker is saying, but also doubt. Your behavior, your attitudes, and so on. So please, during these talks, Have a rational doubt. You know, it's like having a dog on a leash. You, if you keep him all the time on the leash, you break the spirit of the dog. But you must let him, let the leash go and let him run, because then he, he becomes alive. 
So similarly, if you doubt all the time, then it doesn't lead anywhere. But know when to release and when to hold it in check. That requires intelligence. But to doubt when you release, why you release the doubt? You are doubt, you are acceptance and so on. That alerts the mind, quickens the thought, awareness. So please, as we said, we are talking over together. This is not a lecture where you listen, you are told or given certain concepts, certain formulas, certain clichés, and you accept them and go home. But here we are not lecturing, we are having a conversation, like two people having a friendly conversation to find out, to inquire deeply. And I hope that you are going to do this, not merely listen to the speaker, but also use the speaker as a mirror in which you see yourself. And when you have seen yourself, you can throw away the mirror. Mirror is not important. So we are going together, inquire into the very complex problem of fear. Why man, millennia after millennia, has sustained, nourished, bore the burden of fear that has been one of the deep conscious as well as unconscious factors in life. We are all afraid of something or other. Ultimately, the fear of death, fear of punishment, and so accept reward, because we are always balancing between reward and punishment. Please watch this in yourself, not just the speaker's words. So why has man not been able to solve this problem of fear? There are many forms of fear. You may be frightened of the dark, you may be frightened of the future, or frightened of the past, frightened of your husband or your wife, frightened of your guru. You may adore him, you may worship him, I don't know, that's your own affair, but there is always the lurking of fear behind. So we must examine this problem very closely. Fear is a movement, it's not static, it's a movement. And it's the aggregate of many other factors, aggregate being summation, beginning together of all the other factors or the movements that bring about fear. And we are going to examine together, please together, the movements, which is comparison, desire for security. We are going to go into all this desire for security, authority, desire, time. Thought. These are all the various movements of fear. And we are asking whether man can ever be free of fear at all. Because fear is a dreadful thing. 
it darkens our lives. From fear we are act neurotically. From fear, where there is fear, there is no love. So fear Am I too close or too far away? Too close. Too close. May I go further back? No. Okay. We are asking whether fear can ever, man can ever be free of this terrible burden. One may not be conscious of it, it may be lurking in the deep unconsciousness, in the deep recesses of one's own brain. You may say, I'm not afraid, I have no fear, but that's a superficial statement. But most people are go through fear and agony of fear, and from that agony there is great many sorrowful actions, neurotic actions, unethical actions, immoral actions. So please listen carefully, not to the only speaker, listen to your own fear. Don't run away from it, we'll hold it together and examine closely what brings about this fear. We said, first of all, comparison. We're always comparing ourselves with somebody else. We start this in schools, better marks and so on, right through university, college, university, this sense of constant comparison. Have you ever tried not to compare at all? That is, of course, you have to compare between two cars, between two materials. If you are choosing a furniture, you have to compare. But when you compare psychologically, then there is always a root of fear in it. Root of fear is there. I compare myself with you. You are very clever, very intelligent, bright, alive, aware, sensitive. And through comparison I say, I am not. I am dull compared to you. If I do not compare myself with you, what happens to me? Am I dull? Or I am what I am, and from there I start to find out. But if I am all the time comparing with you, who are bright, nice looking, then I am running away from myself, trying to imitate, trying to conform to the pattern you have set. You are following all this? So, is it possible? to live inwardly, psychologically, psychically, without any sense of comparison. Because comparison is one of the f- movements of fear. 
you do you understand? It is, see the, the danger of comparison, which maintains fear. You are something great, I want to be like you. And if I am not like you, I begin to get depressed, all the other factors enter into it. So please discover for yourself if you can live without any comparison whatsoever. Inwardly, of course, not outwardly, because you are taller and shorter or different colour. But inwardly, to have no comparison, which doesn't mean that you are vain, that you are arrogant, but if I am comparing myself with you, I can never discover what I am. I am always conforming to what you think I am. So that is one of the factors of fear. Then we are always seeking security. Both physically and psychically, that is, inwardly, psychologically, we are seeking security. So outward security, like a house, food, shelter are absolutely necessary, obviously, otherwise you and I wouldn't be sitting here. So we must have that security. But that security is denied to all people when each one of us is seeking security for ourselves. Right? You are following this? Look, sirs, this is a very complex question of security, this search for security, this movement that each of us, inwardly as well as outwardly, seeking security. Security being protection, stability, a sense of certainty, a state of mind that is not confused, to be completely secure. Outwardly it has become almost impossible to be secure, because there is division between nations, there is division between races, there is division between linguis- linguistically different. I hope you are following all this. There is the division of nationalities, which is bringing about the destruction of security for all human beings. This is obvious. But we, human beings, will live in a state of tribalism. See what we are all doing, either we are Parsis or Hindus or Buddhists or Christians, you know, or belonging to some sect, belonging to some guru, all the rest of it. So this is a form of seeking security, outwardly. Inwardly, is there security at all? Please question it. Suppose I depend for my security on my... some concept I have, some belief I have, that belief 
that concept, that conclusion gives me a sense of security. I may seek security in knowledge or in some form of illusion. Right? You are following the illusion. That is, I project an idea which may be right or wrong, or belief in something which is, has no ra- rational value, and I depend on that, I hold on to that. That gives me a sense of complete security. Like a Catholic, he believes in all kinds of extraordinary things, like the Hindus. And in that belief, in that conclusion, in their ideologies, there is certain security. But that security is always to be, can be thrown away, uh, can be by reason, by pointing out, it becomes insecure. You follow? So, is there security? I may depend for security psychologically on my wife, on my husband. I depend. I am attached. And in that attachment, in that dependence, there is certain form, subtle form of security. And also unconsciously, There is the doubt that this security may not be real, because she might go away tomorrow. So there is always doubt, there is always insecurity in the search of security personally, psychologically. Right? So we are asking, please, this is very important to ask and find out if you can live not with security, but with intelligence, because that is the ultimate security, a man who is really intelligent. Then in that there is no fear whatsoever. So we have to inquire, children's hot. We have to inquire into what is intelligence. The word intelligence, from Latin and so on, is not only to read between the lines, you understand? Read between the lines. I re- suppose you receive a letter. In that letter everything is not expressed, but we have to have a clear mind to read between the words, get the significance of it. That's part of that intelligence. And also intelligence means to gather a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, and act skillfully with that knowledge. That's partly, partly intelligence, right? If I am an engineer, I gather knowledge all about engineering, the stresses and the strains, the mathematics and so on, so on. And according to that knowledge, I act. So that's also part of knowledge. But all that such knowledge is limited because it's based on knowledge. As we pointed out the other day, knowledge is always limited. Right? And if you seek comfort, security in knowledge, you are seeking security in a very limited thing. Therefore, it will always create fear. Or if you have any kind of concept to, to hold, 
that also will cause fear. But if you see that any dependence, any attachment, any adherence to a belief is not intelligent, then that very intelligence gives you security. Is this clear somewhat? Am I, are we making this clear? Yeah, all right. I hold on to some image I have, image of God, image of some concept and so on. In that I find a great deal of security. I find I'm protected. But the God, the belief, is a projection of my thought. Right? I have projected it as God, and in that I seek security. I feel safe. But when, I, when you tell me to examine this very closely, I begin to discover that I am doing a very stupid thing, and I get frightened, and I run away from it. But if I see the truth of what you are saying, which is that thought has projected God, and, I've, and that which is thought has projected, thought then worships, which is totally unintelligent. But if I see the fact that it is unintelligent, there is already intelligence. You see. Therefore, in that intelligence there is security. That intelligence is not yours or mine. It is intelligence. So, like, there is no Western thought and Eastern thought. There is only thought. The Western may express it in one way, and you might express it in another, but it is still the activity of thought, which is come to all mankind. So, security exists only in intelligence, not in cleverness, not in knowledge. Intelligence is about knowledge and the feeling of belonging, holding on to something. Intelligence is wisdom, and wisdom cannot be bought in books. Wisdom is not repetition of some, what somebody has said. Intelligence comes – when there is intelligence, there is wisdom. And there is only security in this quality of intelligence that is above all thought. So this is a movement that is, we examine comparison, which is competition, which brings fear. We are also examining security, which also breeds fear. But also we are going to examine together authority. Of course, the authority of law is one thing. You have to pay taxes, that's one, one of the laws. That's an authority, collective authority for the protection of the collective. Right? We're not questioning that. You can question it, change it politically, religiously, and so on. But you are questioning the whole concept of authority. The whole burden of authority which man has carried for millennia. We are saying one of the causes of fear is authority. Have you ever considered if you had no authority whatsoever, how would you behave? 
social authority, the authority of books, the authority of gurus, the authority of state, the authority of the superior, and so on. If you had no authority, would you have fear? Or you would do exactly what you want to do, which you are doing now. You are following all this? Are we meeting each other? Or are you merely listening to a talk? So we are questioning, and it is right to question, doubt, all authority. The authority of a wife over the husband, or the husband over the wife, the authority of so called leaders, the authority of the priests, the gurus, the authority of the speaker, the reputation of the speaker, which breeds authority. So why do we obey? Why do we follow? Because in that following, obeying, we feel that there is certain security. You know better than I do, therefore I follow you. You are the authority and I become the slave. It may be pleasurable or unpleasant, but I follow you, because in that following I feel gregarious, together. You know what you are doing, and I don't, so I accept you. In that there is also fear. I don't know if you are following all this, because, sirs, we are examining and finding out if it is possible at all to live absolutely without any shadow of fear. Then our, we are then extraordinary human beings. So we have examined together comparison, security, authority. And what to talk over together the factor of desire, because desire also is one of the movements which cause fear. What is desire? Why man is a slave to desire? Why desires predominates our lives? Why religions have suppressed, have said, suppress all desire? If you want to serve God, you must be free from all desire, from all wanting. Why? And we are asking not how to suppress desire, how to run away from desire, but to understand the movement of desire. What is the essence of desire? These crows are making a lot of noise tonight, aren't they? They are saying probably good night to each other. So we are together going to examine, look, observe, not even examine, just observe. As you would observe beautiful sunset, as you would observe light on, a, on water as you observe 
the new moon, just to observe without any sense of regret, without wanting, changing, just to look at something, without reward or punishment. So we are going to look together at the whole movement of desire, because it's very complex. We are not advocating suppression or escape or to deny. We are going to see the nature of it, the structure of it. Right? Are we together in this? So we are asking, what is desire? Not the ob- objects of desire. The objects may be a shirt, a robe, a sari, a car, a house. We are not talking about the objects of desire. But desire itself, how it arises and why human beings are so caught up in it. You are waiting for me to explain. That's the tragedy of modern mind. They want explanations, they want interpretations, or an interpreter who will tell, who will translate what I am speaking, because they find it awfully difficult what I am speaking, what the speaker is saying, so they need a commentator. This is how we live. We never look, understand, delve into ourselves to find out deeply what is desire, what is love, what is compassion, if there is God, what me, what happened, what is death. We never ask passionately. And we're asking this we are asking this question passionately, not intellectually, verbally. Because desire is one of the strongest motives in our lives. It has tremendous energy. A man who is in an office, he's got great desire to succeed, to work like furiously, to reach the top. The desire to become enlightened, whatever that may mean. And you practice struggle, sacrifice, deny. So this is very important to understand what is desire, how it arises, what is its origin. You see, when you look at that. Look at the movement of this desire. Please, just listen to it. When you look at the movement of desire, there is great beauty in it, this great sense of extraordinary vitality in it. So please look at your desire to be rich, to be poor, to be a sannyasi, to be enlightened, to be Whatever the desire is, sexual, sensory, whatever desire it is, look at it. Hold it in front of you and look at it and see how it arises. What's the origin, the beginning of this extraordinary vitality, which is called desire? I will exp- the speaker will explain, but the explanation is not desire. The word is not the fact, right? So you are looking at your desire and trying to understand how it, what is its origin, its depth, its extraordinary expanse of it.
Please, as I said, you are waiting for me to explain. I will exp- the speaker will explain very in detail. But stay with your desire. Look at it. Hold it like a precious jewel, so that you, you are looking at it with great, with clear eyes. She says, we have become second-hand human beings. We have never discovered anything for ourselves. We are always – we read, we are told, we are psychologists, the gurus, the saints – they tell us what to do, and we follow them. So we have always be- – we have become second-hand mediocre human beings. And when the, this problem of desire is explained, you will say, yes, I agree with that. But it's not your discovery, it's not your passionate understanding of it, and you are free of something, but always waiting for some explanation, some direction. I am going to it now. Patience. You know, patience has no time. Impatience has. You understand that? Must I explain that? When you are patient now, really looking at your desire, patiently looking at it, you are not thinking about time. But when you are impatient to find an explanation, a resolution of it, then you have time. Whereas if you are patient, that is, looking at something which you have to deeply, profoundly understand, there is no time at all. And where there is no time, there is no there is patience, real patience. I wonder if you understand that. What is desire? Why religions throughout the world have said, be without it, always associated with sex. Sannyasis are, are supposed to be chaste, no sex, but they are burning inside. And so they suppress and go through all the agonies of it. Now we go together, please, together. We are going to go into this question of desire. You have to pay little attention. If you are asleep, please wake up. Because it's very complex, requires careful step by step explanation and understand. Our brain is the centre of all senses. It is the centre of all the responses of the senses. And we use our senses partially. If you are an eye doctor, you only look partially at the eyes, you don't look at the whole human being. If you are a heart specialist, you are only concerned with the heart. 
You are following all this? So our brain is the essence of senses and its responses. And our brain has been conditioned through millennia to the drive of desire. Right? You are following me? It has become our habit. So, in, invest, in looking at desire, you have got to be aware of your, how, how the brain looks at desire, how it feels it, what is its sensation. I'll, I'll explain. Sensation is the response of our nervous organism, our sense response. You see something beautiful. Seeing, then contact with that something beautiful, uh, with that contact there is sensation, right? I see a beautiful piece of furniture, the seeing of a beautiful piece of furniture, touching it, then sensation from it. Now, that's a norm, right? Seeing, touching, contact, then sensation. Here. Now, then thoughts come in and says, I wish I had that furniture in my room. Which is, thought creates out of that sensation the image of me si- sitting on that chair in my room. Right? Is this clear? Sens- seeing, contact, sensation, then thought, seeing that furniture, creating the image of me sitting in that furniture. So, the moment when thought creates the image, that is the second Desire is more. Have you understood this? This is very simple if you look at it for yourself. I see a beautiful suit or a beautiful robe, sari, whatever it is. I go inside the shop, touch the material, sensation, then thought creates the image of me in that suit. At that moment when thought creates the image, then that's the origin of desire. Got it? You understand this? I see a man riding in a rich car, Beautiful car, there are no beautiful cars in this country, but there are beautiful cars. And I see it going by, or I see it in the street, locked. I go up to it, look at it all, look at it, touch it. Then thought says, I wish I I owned that car sitting in there and driving. The moment of identification of thought with the image of me sitting in that car, that is the moment of desire. You understand? This This is clear. I am not going to repeat it over and over, it has no meaning. Now, can one be aware, attentive – please listen to this – contact, see, perceive, Perception, 
contact, sensation. And be aware at the moment when thought creates the image that requires extraordinary attention, so that the image is never formed. You understand this? I wonder if you see the beauty of it. So that the mind, the brain is so active at that moment, there is no desire. Because you are not cre- thought is not creating the image. So desire being one of the factors of our life, of our daily life, and in finding out, discovering for oneself the origin, the beginning of that desire, and seeing that desire has its own fear, because I may not sit in the car, I may not have that dress, or if I do I may spoil it. There is always unconscious fear behind desire. So I have said, comparison, seeking security, authority, desire. These are the movements of fear. I haven't finished yet. Don't stop there. There is also the factor of time. Time is fear. That is, if I am killed instantly now, I have no fear. But if I think about death ending, in the, not carrying all my wealth to the next world, which I can't anyhow. So I'm afraid, right? So we ought to consider together what is time. I hope you're not tired. What is time? Time is a movement. which is from here to there, requires time. Right? I live here and go back to my home. Uh, I am attending this meeting and I have to go back home. That takes time. From one point to another point requires movement, which is time. Covering the distance requires time. And if I have an ideal, which is I have, I am violent, I am not, and I have an ideal of non-violence. If I have that, uh, to achieve that non-violence, whatever that may mean, that requires time. So, time is, according to the watch, chronological time, time by the sun and sunrise and sunset. That is the outward time. Psychological time. That is, I am I am this, but I hope to be that. I am not good, but I will be good. So the becoming requires time. You understand? Please understand this really deeply, because you will see something extraordinary if you understand this. Becoming something requires time. To learn a skill requires time. But if I am not good, say, I am a hypocrite, better, much better. I am a hypocrite, because I double talk. and. I say to myself, I must not be a hypocrite. That will take time. If I am aware at all, I am a hypocrite, and not wanting to be a hypocrite, that will take time. At least that's our, our brain is conditioned 
to tap, right? Because the brain itself has evolved through time. It's not your brain. It's the brain of mankind. I won't go into that for the moment. It's too complex. <coughs> so there is time to learn a skill, a language, to drive a car, to learn any trade requires time. And I am this, I hope to be that. Now, the hoping to be that is unreal. Are you following on this? What is real is what, what is. What is has no time. You understand this? But what? I'm so caught up in my own. What is and what should be are two different things, right? What is looking at what is, that is, I am not good, that's what is. Or rather, let me take a much simpler example. I am violent, that's what is. But what is the becoming non violent is not. That's not, that's not a fact. So, what is has no time. But if I have something in my mind, in my brain, which says I should not be that, but be that, then that requires time. You following this? So, to remain with what is and the resolution of what is has no time. You see this? Huh? I've got this. So, as we said the other day, we are the past, the present, and the future. We are the past modifying itself in the present and continuing the future. We are the time makers. Right? We can be free of time or create time. I create time when I say I am this and I should be that. I create time. But <coughs> I do not create time if I say this is what is and live it, look at it. In that observation there is no time. The looking without time, which is the past, all that, <coughs> looking at it dissolves whatever, the pro- whatever what is. You try it, do it, and you will discover for yourself. Right? We are the makers of time. When I say I hope to be something, that is making time. So please understand this extraordinary subtle factor that we are creating our own time. And therefore we are slave to time. Which is I I must achieve something. I must become something, therefore you are creating time. But if you say, if you understand the nature of time and remain totally with what is, I am am jealous, envious, let me say, I am envious. Don't try to transform it into something else. Remain with that envy and look at it, observe it. As you observe, it dissolves without that observation, there is no time. Do it, find out. So time is a factor of fear. I am afraid of the past, 
or the future or even the present. So time is a factor of fear. One of the factors of fear is comparison. Don't learn it by heart. <laughs> Look at it. Comparison, searching for security, which, which is to deny intelligence, then this whole concept of authority, which make us slaves, psychophantic, how one grovels in front of authority. I've seen it all over the world, especially in this country. It exists all over the world. But meet a minister and you're all down on your knees, or a guru or somebody or other in authority, which is you are worshipping reputation not the reality. And also one of the movements of fear is desire, and one of the movements of fear is time. And the other fact is thought. Thought, which is the response of memory, memory is the collection, is the outcome of knowledge. Knowledge is, the, is experience. That is thought. I think about the future and I'm frightened. Right? I think about what may happen. I am very healthy, but I may fall ill. Or I have fallen sick, remember it, and frightened not to be sick again. So thought is the operation of past memory, past experience, past knowledge, and thought says, I hope all that will not happen in the future. Therefore there is fear which thought has created. I wonder if you understand all this. I have a job, good job, but I may lose the job. Thought says, you might lose it. Be psychophantic to the boss. You follow? The whole movement of thought is which creates fear. So the aggregate of all this, which is the collection of all this, all these movements, is the root of fear. If I have understood, if, if there is a, a complete intelligent observation of all this, the root the cause of all this, then where there is a cause, there is an end. Right? You see this? That is, there is a cause for ill health. If I see the cause, unless I am utterly stupid, that cause tells me what, why I am not healthy. Then I can act upon it, and then there is help. So where there is a cause, there can be an end to it. So we see the whole movement of causation of fear. I wonder, right? The whole movement of, of fear, the cause of all this, of this terrible burden man has carried. When you see it all, aggregate as a whole, not as comparison all the rest of it, when you see it as a whole movement, the totality of that movement, then there is a complete ending of that fear, of fear.
Now, are you free of fear now? Are you going to going home and start the whole business again? You might say, ask the speaker, are you psychologically free from fear? Won't you ask that question? No? Of course it's in your mind. If I if the speaker says yes, what value has it to you? If the the speaker doesn't talk about all this unless he does it himself, right? It isn't a double talk. Where there is no fear, there is love. Negation of fear is the most positive action, and the negation is the understanding of the whole movement of fear. And pleasure is another one of our basic pursuits, the pursuit of pleasure. What is the relationship of fear and pleasure? Have you ever asked that question? Or we are merely pursuing pleasure at any cost? So we have to go into this question, now, not now, perhaps tomorrow, if you are here, and I am here, and I am afraid I will be here. Tomorrow we can talk over this. Because you see, sir, it's no good talking endlessly about these matters. Words don't mean a thing unless you live it, unless you are absolutely have integrity. When you say, I'm not afraid, you mean it. Because we have examined the whole movement of fear, then you are, you are an extraordinary human being. Then you are. That is real meditation. What we have done this evening, the understanding of desire, is profound meditation. And that requires a great deal of attention, subtlety of brain, quickness of perception, which no amount of reading, following, will bring it about. What will bring it is your observation of everything around you, the squalor, the dirt, the terrible misery of human beings. And in that perception, you see the whole of human mind, how stagnant it is, how dead it is. So one has to question doubt, and out of that doubt, cleansing, purifying, the past, the whole nature, then you are really an extraordinary human being and there is no fear, then gods disappear. <laughs>